Good afternoon, Mr. Robles. How are you? <laughs> Mr. Robles, get the officer. You need to unmute your mic. What about now? Sounds great. Good, good. Good afternoon, too, sir. Good. Mr. Robles, would you please give us your full name and your Department of Corrections ID. Uh, Wine and Cornelius Rovers, DOC number 615613. Thank you, Mr. Rovers. My name is Alvin Roche. To my left is Ms. Bonnie Jackson. To my right is Mr. Keith Freeman. Let me explain the process to you. I will read some information in the record. We'll verify that information, and then we'll give the officer at um, Franklin a chance to make comments. And then we have some guests present. Uh, we have a friend, Ms. Anita Seabrook, and she would like to make a statement. And we also have the victim's mother, Ms. Sarah Grandier, uh, and she would like to make a statement. After the statements, before we vote, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, make a brief statement on your behalf. You understand the process? Yes, sir. Officer, would you like to tell us anything about Mr. Roberts? Sir, uh, I've known Mr. Roberts since he's gotten here. Uh, we haven't had no issues with him, uh, no write-ups or anything like that. He does work in our law library here. Great. Uh, Mr. Robles, your case has been assigned to Mr. Freeman. Would you please answer Mr. Freeman's questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Robles, how old are you? I am 43 years of old, sir. Okay, how long have you served on this sentence? I have served 10 years and two months. Uh, what's your educational level? Uh, some college education. That's my highest level, some college education. Um, Mr. Groves, tell me what happened. Is that your niece or you were a uh, stepfather? Victim. Um, I was I was a, a boyfriend to the victim's mother. I, I, I was just a, a guardian, I would I, as you would say. Okay. Well, tell me what happened uh, and, and tell me the truth. I got all the reports. I just want to see what you have to say. Uh, sir, uh, I'm not going to deny any reports. I definitely tried to touch uh, the victim. Uh, multiple times I did touch her. Um, I did it out of selfishness. I did it because I have a problem. I have a problem with a sexual disorder that been battling now for a long time. And I think about everything that's happened, especially I think about the bravery of, of uh, what uh, the victim Elizabeth did uh, to be able to come out and uh, say about what I was doing, because uh, I know that takes courage to do that. And at the time I was selfish. I, I, I didn't care about anybody. I lied about the reason why I was being in a relationship with uh, the mother, Sarah Branier, uh, just to make up that I was a, a cancer victim, just to be able to be with her for my own selfish reasons, for my own selfish desires. I didn't care about anybody. I didn't care about myself. I didn't care about Elizabeth at all. I didn't care about Sarah. I didn't care about my mother. I didn't care about my ex-wife. The only thing I wanted to do was satisfy my gratifications for sexual desire. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. You, you said, uh, you know, you understand you're sick and it's a the disease. What, what are you doing and what are you going to do to make sure this never happens again? Well, sir, I have uh, been taking many programs. I took Celebrate Recovery. Uh, recently, I did take the victim, uh, victim of Impact Awareness, and I did take the Cognitive Distortion Sexual uh, Treatment Program. Um, 
from what I've seen, sir, and what I know, every single day waking up is a reminder to me of what I've done to other people. I think about every single day how this has affected everybody. And even, even after my death, it's going to affect other people. It's a non-rippling effect. And my main motivation every single day is to do whatever I can to make right choices, to never be put in that situation again, to put anyone in that situation again. I know there's nothing I can do about the thoughts, but there's things I can do about the actions. Okay. All right. Um, what's your transition plan? Where, where are you gonna live? Uh, my transition plan, sir, is uh, uh, if I am released, I plan to uh, return back to uh, uh, to my mother's in Massachusetts through Interstate Compact. Um, if that is not the case, uh, there is other family members to be able to go to. Uh, in case that is not available, uh, I do have a transition specialist here who is willing to help me find assistance uh, to to get back in the community. And I do have a mother who is able to financially support me as well. Um, staff, does he have any detainers in Texas? Do we know? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, you completed all uh, phases of the sex offender program. Uh, you also taken numerous other classes. What class you took that you got the most out of? The sex offender program, sir. Um, I think you've explained to us why you got the most out of that one already. Your risk is low, your needs are low. Warden says you hadn't been a problem there. How long has he been there, Warden? Or well, not exactly on the date he's been here. Uh, I came here on March 11th to participate in the class. That was 2003? Uh, 2012, I mean, 2022, sir. March okay. of 22. You come up from Concordia Parish? That is correct, yes. I was a trustee there, and uh, the transition specialist was able to uh, open an opportunity to participate in that pro in that class. And for the questions. Mrs. Jackson. So, Mr. Rovers, uh, do you believe that the urge that led you to commit this crime is going to be with you forever? Uh, Ma'am, to be honest with you, I can't honestly answer that question. I can't, I can't say if it will or not. But what I can do is prevent what, it. I'm sorry. What do you think? It seems like it's a pretty strong urge. It is a very strong urge, ma'am. It's a very strong thought pattern is a very strong urge. And how long How long have you had those urges and that thought pattern? Ma'am, I would definitely have to say um, since I was probably around 20 years old. So um, how do you, how do you think you're gonna be able to control that thought pattern, those urges? Well, one way, ma'am, is to, to participate in programs, to participate in church, uh, to find good people that I can combine to. That whenever sometimes, I... sometimes churches are fertile, shall we say, hunting grounds. That is correct, ma'am. You're right about I'm that. I'm trying to figure out what specific tools have you learned to fall back on when you find yourself, and you probably will, having those thoughts and urges. How are you going to deal with that in the moment as it comes up? Well, ma'am, if those urges do come out, those urges do come about, first thing I would definitely contact is 
my mother who I'd be living with, I would contact, I would I, be honest with you, ma'am, the first person I would come to is God. God again, okay, when you took your sex offender treatment program, didn't they talk to you about the kinds of things that would trigger a person to act on those, uh, put you in a position or trigger you to act out? And we'll call them your fantasies. I mean, give me something kind for your mom can't help you. I mean, first of all, most people are going to call their mom and tell them, mom, I think I'm going to go molest a child. That's the kind of thing you want to hide from your mom. Yeah, I agree, man. I'm trying to figure out what techniques, what tools have you learned uh, to prevent you from acting on urges that you both know you're going to have again. So tell me some specific things that they taught you uh, so that you don't end up reoffending. Well, ma'am, I know in the phase three of the program, they had a lot of scenarios that they went through, different types of scenarios where, mm -hmm. where offenders were released and they experienced different type of situations. As if someone was attempted to go to a park and, and seek a victim, or if someone, a victim was coming into their house and they talked about the high, low, and mis uh, high, low medium and risk factors about identifying uh, when a situation comes up to identify how that situation is going to be. Uh, the one thing I know is that to always to make sure to be in a low risk situation. So to answer your question, if I am faced with that situation is to isolate myself, to make sure that I'm by myself, that I'm not around any victims, or if I am around a potential victim to be sure that I'm not alone, to be around other people as well to discourage me from even trying to persuade to attempt to molest a child. That is the techniques with, that we learned in the class. Well, um, I like chocolate. And even though I know maybe I shouldn't be around it, I got chocolate in my house. You see what I mean? Let me ask you now. Do you know why you have those urges? Let's, let's try it that way. Do you know why you have those urges, where those urges came from for you? Ma'am, if I really, I believe it's because of my obesity. It was because of my obesity that I wasn't able to find uh women to be attracted to defined sexually and the only one of my woman i ever had was my wife at the time and the next person who showed any kind of remote or any type of attraction to me was uh a miss sarah Branyan. and i remember at the time she said she didn't want to have the relationship with me we had a long distance relationship and i didn't want that to happen I still wanted to have her. I still wanted to be with her. I didn't care about anything else except wanting to have that attraction, having that intimacy. So I did anything in my possibility, manipulate, lie, deceive, put everyone, as we say, underneath the bus to get what I needed. But then when I moved in with Sarah- Let me, let me ask you this, if you had a wife, why did you feel like you were in a relationship that was sexually gratifying if you had a wife? I'm just trying to understand. I'm not. I'm oh, my, to... Because my wife specifically told me that she was not physically attracted to me, that she was just having sex out of obligation as a, as a wife. And that was a devastating thing for me. Listen, did you ever make any efforts to uh, take control of your health and your weight and, you know, do things that 
if, if not would make you more attractive, it would certainly make you healthier. Yes, that is correct, ma'am. That is correct. I know before I came to Louisiana, I told Sarah that I was going to go get gastric bypass. And I, 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 I was believing this lie so much that I actually got gastric bypass surgery. And I did lose a lot of weight from the gastric bypass surgery. But even as my weight loss happened, even though I lost the weight, there was a still notion that I, I wanted people to accept me. I wanted someone to accept me in uh, any way, shape, or form. And I, I noticed when I came to Louisiana that Elizabeth, the victim, didn't really want to accept me. And I just didn't take it because I was coming to Louisiana. I wanted her to like me. I wanted her to love me. I wanted her to treat, see me as a, as a father figure. And in my own mindset, in my own way, I was willing to do anything possible to get that from her, if that including sexually molesting her. And it wasn't only until then said and done, coming to realization that that was, that was a monster, an absolute monster. Do you think your crime has affected uh, Elizabeth? I, I can't, I, in so many ways, shapes and forms, I can't even imagine. Well, you don't have to imagine. I'm sure that's something they talked about in your sex offender treatment program. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm sure it's affected how she's viewed men, how she, her, her maybe her, how she deals sexually with, 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 partners or whoever she's with, how she can trust men, having people, having anyone in her life, how that affects her, how, how she can't even have a difficult time trusting, to always be cautious, always maybe thinking that what happened to her was her fault, thinking that everything that happened to her was because of her. All right, well, thank you for uh, answering my questions. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Freeman. Uh, I just want to state for the record that uh, the district attorney is opposed. Uh, Sheriff Craig Weber is opposed. Uh, the chief of police, Brian Zerang, is unopposed. And uh, we didn't speak with your mother, but the victims also uh, and their family are strongly opposed. I just want to put that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. At this time, uh, would Ms. Anita Seabrook open your mic and give us your statement? Yes, and for the record, my name is Anita Durrett. Um, Zoom meetings. My name is Anita Durrett and I am Wine and Rova's friend. I met Winan at the First Baptist Church in Holliston, Mass, where I attended services with my husband and family. Winan was probably about 12 years old at the time, and I am friends with Winan's mother, Becky Rovers. Although at the time I was not so close to the family, I could tell that Winan did not have an easy upbringing. Uh, when mine and married, we sort of lost touch. Um, all during his teenage years, I tried to uh, keep my eye on him and mentor him as I could. Um, when I heard he had been arrested, I was moved to begin to write him. Um, I'm also a recovered victim of childhood sexual abuse. I wanted to do whatever I could to make sure that Wynand would not offend again whenever he was released from prison. I'm also a committed Christian. I believe in healing for Wynan and for his victim. My life is a testimony to the ability to be healed. I also believe in accountability. The past nine plus years, I have been Wynan's friend and accountability partner. I have tried many times to find a male to write to him and be part of his life, uh, unfortunately to no avail. Um, over this time, I've seen a lot of changes in Winan. I would describe him growing up as a very emotionally immature young adult. 
Uh, he became active in a recovery program, Celebrate Recovery, while in prison. Um, I happen to be also a recovered alcoholic of 32 years of sobriety, so I'm very familiar with addicts. Um, in our writings and telephone calls, Winan has always taken full responsibility for his actions. I have found that unusual because most addicts don't do that um, unless they work in a program of recovery, which I believe Winan is. When the service of the Celebrate Recovery became unavailable to him, our items became meetings and letters. We've done Bible study together. We have also had hard conversations about childhood sexual abuse. It was not easy for either of us, but I believe it produced much fruit in both of our recovery. I believe in healing for both the perpetrator and victim. I believe it is a one day at a time program and time commitment. I believe with the continuation of his recovery program, Celebrate Recovery, which is very near his house, um, his solid relationship with Jesus and our friendship, I believe Winan will be an asset to society. I plan on continuing my friendship with him and he plans to go home to take care of his mother who is not in good health. Thank you for letting me share. Yeah. Ms. Juanita, I can only tell what our system recognized you as, and it recognized you as Anita Seabrook. Seabrook is where I live in New Hampshire. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, can, we, can we hear from Sarah Guarnier, uh, the victim's mother? Would you please open your mic? Identify yourself and your relationship to this hearing. Uh, my name is Sarah Granier. Elizabeth, the victim, is my daughter. Here we have your statement. Thanks. Thank you once again for the opportunity to speak regarding the release of Mr. Rovers. Every time he's up for parole, I ask my daughter if she wants to speak or write a statement, and as she does not want to replay trauma from her youth, she decides against it. I don't blame her, and I will continue to speak on her behalf. It has been 10 years since Mr. Rovers was arrested and removed from our home. In that time, Elizabeth has attended and graduated from an elite residential high school, and this Saturday, she will graduate summa cum laude from Nichols State University with a degree in environmental biology. She finished an entire college degree in only three years. She not only finished early, she is also receiving the highest academic honor possible. She starts grad school in the fall, also in biology, and has received a fully paid research grant to cover all of her expenses while earning her master's degree. She wants to be a botanist, which I have learned is a doctor of plants, and I fully support that. She's loved plants her, her entire teenagehood into adulthood. Overall, she's doing great. She has a core group of friends that are supportive and kind, and she has been dating a guy for about a year now who treats her really well. She still lives with me and will probably do so until she finishes her master's and then enters the, the workforce. Like with most abuse victims, you can't tell that she's been molested. A snapshot of her current life would show a confident and competent young woman about to turn 21 with the whole world in front of her but there are little situations that I attribute to her abuse, things like not willing to go to the doctor when the doctor is male. She has flat refused to get a gynecological exam. It's just, it's a, uh, whenever she meets with any kind of health care professional, it is, it is look only don't touch. She will not, you know, have a, a full pelvic exam. We work through these situations as they present themselves. Um, we are not afraid for ourselves of Mr. Rovers being released. When he was sentenced, our DA told us the best we can hope for is for him to serve two thirds of his sentence. And he's done that. I fear for other children who may be victimized in the future as the recidivism rate for child sex offenders increases over time. And now that I hear from his own mouth, the extent of his need for sexual satisfaction from children, I'm horrified for children who fall in his path upon his release. Whether you decide to release or not, 
I respect the decision of the parole board. Thank you for once again hearing my statement. Thank you so much. I appreciate the update on Elizabeth. Um, Mr. Robles? Yes, sir. Would you like to make a brief closing statement? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, for the past, I'm sorry, can you still hear me? Yes. All right. Sir, for the past 10 years, when I say I have diligently fought to handle any type of thought, feeling, anything that could trigger any type of emotion that could trigger the sexual dysfunction that is in within me. I know that what I have is not curable. There is no cure for it. But what I know I can do is that I can make choices about it. The last thing I want to do is hurt another human being. I don't want to hurt anybody ever again. And I know that's not a plausible cause, but it's something I can strive to do every single day, even while I'm incarcerated or whether I'm out on the street. What I want, my desire is to be a better person, to make better amends for what I've done. I know there's no money can do to make change the differences of what I've done. But one thing I do know is that I can live a better life. I can live a better life and I can make better decisions. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Uh, is the panel ready to vote? Uh, yes. Mr. Freeman. Okay, Mr. Rose, I, I think you've been totally honest with us today. But, you know, part of my job is to worry about public safety. And, and uh, you realize the extent of your disease, but I still just have that doubt whether you can control it or not. And, and that doubt, uh, I just can't get it out of my mind. So just due to the public risk of public safety and also victim opposition, I vote to deny. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Ms. Jackson. Mr. Alvarez, um, I think on an intellectual level, you do understand some of the factors that have led to um, your development, um, but I'm not sure that you've really done deep enough into you and, and acknowledge maybe some, some things that might have contributed to your dire fun for children. And I am concerned. I, I truly am concerned that you still are not equipped to avoid uh, repeating this kind of conduct. It just there's an uneasiness that I have. And so I just don't feel that you're ready to be released into society. So my concerns are primarily about public safety. And I feel like you need to dig a little deeper truly understand why you behave the way you do. Work on your self-esteem so you don't need to resort to this kind of behavior uh, to satisfy your desire to be accepted or loved. And you gotta accept of yourself first. And so uh, because of my concerns for public safety, I vote to Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Rollins, I had a long, drawn out statement to give you, but Ms. Jackson and Mr. Freeman has summed it up, and I'm not going to repeat everything they say, but my concern major is that you are a risk to public safety and I'm not about to 
to reach you. I vote to deny. We have received three votes to deny the request day has been denied. You have a good day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you. Okay. Um, that is our last case at Franklin Parish Pension Center. Thank you so much, officer. Yes, sir. Let's unpack this. Hmm. I guess we can start with this article. And uh, thank you, Richard, for finding it. I tried finding more, but this was it. This was it. Now, he uh, he was extradited from Boston to Louisiana. So thankfully, you know, they took it seriously. They actually went through the process of extraditing him. The, uh, there was a warrant um, under the age of 13. Okay. They set the bond at 150 grand. They always said 50,000. Rovers went before the judge, Robert Greco, in Firmingham District Court Tuesday. The judge kept Rovers' bail at 50 grand. Rovers' attorney for the arraignment, David Gooey, asked the judge to reduce it to 25, stating his client has no prior criminal record. Yeah, he was, took a while for him to get caught, huh? So he'd been living um, since February 2nd for two years with his girlfriend who has a 10-year-old daughter. That means that she was eight years old when he started this. He occasionally watched the daughter who considered him to be a father figure while his girlfriend was at work. So, First of all, first of all, he, he gives an excuse that he molests children, that he has an urge for children because he can't get women because he's obese, because he's insecure. Forget how ridiculous that is, right? But here he is married, and then here he is getting what seems to be a, a beautiful, confident, smart woman to be his girlfriend, to have him move into her home. They were dating for two years in her home. What are you talking about? We have seen one other time where a man came in and he was doing, he was, he was doing this to his own daughter. He was in prison. His wife died. He came back home from prison. And in his own words, he said, I came back home to a teenage girl in my house. And then he was for years. And when he came in front of the board, he did a similar thing. He, he, had, he, he had his plan of manipulation, a whole speech written out about how it, same like here. It, it's a strategic play. There's nothing, there's nothing, um, there's no insight. It's all manipulation. That's my belief. It's a, he's a cockroach, which is what they do, which is like cockroaches, how they adapt and don't die. You can keep, you know, with all the money in the world to find the best cockroach spray, it doesn't exist.
I don't believe his thing for a second, okay? He thought that this would be the, his best chance of getting out was to come up with this whole speech. And that guy did the same thing. He was going on to say that, now think about this, I guess. Think about this. He threw his energy and having this long distance relationship he was getting into how he manipulated her pretended that he had cancer who knows what else to get inside of her home but the whole time the whole time he was doing it so he can get to her daughter think about that This is how sick their disease is. This is how strong the urge is. This is how terrifying this man is, this cockroach, this disgusting creature that really does not belong in free society. He said in his own words, I wanted her. He's not talking about now the daughter, the eight-year-old girl. I wanted her to like me. I wanted her to see me as a father figure, even if it meant that I would have to molest her. What? In his mind, he was, he thinks that what he was doing was, I, I, I don't even know. And then to show, he, he actually says part of his plan for getting better was he would go to church. Thank you. Miss Jackson for saying, whoa, church is a fertile hunting ground for a child predator. On that note, we then have Anita, who says that she was friends with him since he was 12 years old in their church. I don't know what her situation is. You know, you might look at it. A part of it is that, you know, she is a victim and she really wants to protect other children. And, and maybe this is her way of trying to protect them. And if it is, then I could commend her for it. But she also did what might have been a Freudian slip in middle of her. And if you want to go back and watch it, it was bizarre. In middle of her statement, she literally said out of nowhere with no context, I have tried many times to find a male to write to, but with to no avail. It's like, um, what? I was like, what? So, I mean, just with that, I'm just like, I just question everything. And you, yeah, I'll just stop with that. Here's another thing which really, really, really flipped my switch is let's forget, you know, they go listing off the, I think they said the judge was opposed, the DA was opposed, but the chief of police was unopposed. I think in the like, 500 or so hearings that we have done, there have been one, maybe two cases where the police was not opposed. They are by default opposed. It's a blanket policy. 
So the idea that they would say that they're unopposed for this, it just, it doesn't make sense. It really makes me think that someone needs to investigate who that chief of police is because it doesn't make sense. Then, you know what I'm going to say? The DA. I know I do it and it's getting boring by now, but where is the DA? You go through all the trouble, all the financial trouble of extraditing someone to your state so you can lock them up. And good for you for doing that. But then you can't show up. You can't show up to make sure that that person doesn't just serve two-thirds of their sentence. You heard what she said. The DA said, you know what? He'll serve at most two-thirds of his sentence. Well, guess what? He's not. He's going to serve all of it. It's been 10 years that he's been locked up. Two-thirds will make it a 15-year sentence, right? So the DAs are just so tired. They just throw their hands up in the air. Ah, he'll serve two-thirds. It's pathetic. You're so tired with your job, you don't even care. You don't even care to represent, to just be there in support of the victim. The DA had no idea if the if the victim herself wouldn't have shown up to talk. What if she had? You're not going to show that you actually care? You're not going to send a message? Calling her a victim is it is wrong. A survivor, a champion, it's great to hear how well she's doing. And it speaks volumes for her mother. And it's, you know, I, I, I don't know. You know, maybe she thought that she was getting a good man and a safe man because he doesn't look threatening. He doesn't look, you know, maybe to, to, he, he would have done all of his manipulative powers saying he's dying of cancer and this and that. And she got suckered in and, and decided to take a relationship with him. Who knows what the reason reason is, but I'm sure her intentions were pure. Probably thought it was a safe thing to do. And that's the scariest thing about these roaches. The most dangerous roaches don't seem threatening. They seem trusting because they're so manipulative and sick. It's an obsession that they can't control. His life has been devoted to finding children and abusing children. They didn't ask, but who knows who his wife, if his wife that he married, if they had children, I'd be willing to bet that they did. I'd be willing to bet that they did. Not his children, someone else's. This was the first time he was caught, but someone with this disease, he has a he has a trail that is probably as long as from Boston to Louisiana of victims. He blames his obesity. So obesity could do a lot of things to you, but does not make you a child rapist. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> My wife said that I, I didn't, she didn't want to have sex with me because she was just doing it to do it. I do like the little dig. I thought it was a dig. Uh, Miss Jackson is like, well, haven't, did he make an effort to try to lose weight? It might not make you more attractive, but it could make you healthier. <laughs> she was like saying, you're just screwed. <laughs> There's nothing we can do to fix you. And then he goes on this whole thing about surgery. And, and you saw the, uh, you saw m mom, Sarah, like rolling her eyes at him. And you, you knew just from seeing her expression, it was a just another another manipulation, another lie that he was spewing. I really did enjoy her speech. I mean, she hit it out of the park. It was concise. It was, it was Trump, you know, saying we survived this. And she even said, yeah, the, D the DA said that you can get out early, but 
I'm not afraid for me. I'm not afraid for my daughter. We're not afraid of him, this roach, but we're afraid for other kids. Why wouldn't the DA show up and say the same thing? No, it's too busy. You just will leave a statement on paper. Opposed. I'm opposed. He will never be an asset to society. He will only be a risk, a risk to our children. I don't know. I just don't know. You know, another crazy thing, this is a little sad or, or disturbing to think about, but if he had come out and not taken this manipulative approach of, of describing his disease and how he has a disease, and, and if he had just repeated the programs like a robot, like we've seen others do, and he, they probably would have let him go. Because we've seen them let others go all the time. But, you know, his his plan backfired. Thankfully, he overmanipulated uh, his situation and he's going to spend the next five years locked up and he's going to then get free. We'll get extradited to Boston and just beware out there, folks, if you're living out in Boston. Beware. And be careful. First Baptist Church. Beware, because it seems Anita still thinks it's a good idea for him to go there. She said he had a hard life. I don't know. You have your mother still supporting you. You're going to go live off of your mother when you even get out of prison. How hard of a life could it have been? Anyways. With that... I'm going to let you go.